broadcasting worldwide from a studio inside global headquarters of RP Enterprises in Kansas City. In Kansas City. Hey, gang. Ladies and gentlemen, Papa's home. This is the Papa Ron Podcast. Bio transfer in progress. With Ronnie Phillips and Jillian Gray. Showtime. Welcome to episode 35 of the Papa Ron Podcast, brought to you by Brown Piercy Cattle Company. Um, how are you doing with your beef supply from Brown Piercy Cattle Company? Any good stories of some of the things that you've done with the meat that they provided? Well, they provided meat for our entire Easter dinner on oh, Saturday. What'd you guys have? Yeah, we had brisket and oh. then ham. Oh, yeah. And both of them were so good. And it was the first time. Okay, I'm not going to say it's the first time I've cooked brisket because I am certain that I have attempted to cook brisket before but i'm also certain it was not this good and not just because of brown piercy of course that yeah of course of course but also because i had my mother-in-law's recipe ah this time okay and like had her walk me through step by step was this something that you did in the oven or on the smoker or in the oven okay all right in an old school like speckled dutch oven you know like yeah yeah. okay well good good so good i'm a big fan of the reverse sear ribeye you ever heard of that? Reverse cereal? I've prob- heard of it. I'm probably going to post something about it on the Papa Ron podcast, Facebook, and Instagram pages. How do you so, reverse sear? What does that even mean? So what that means is, is you take the ribeye, and what I do, you could do it in the oven, but I do it in a Traeger smoker, right? Okay. And you cook it until you get an internal temperature of about 125 gre- degrees. Okay. All right. 135 would be medium rare. So you get to 125, you take it out, you let it sit for about 15 minutes because it's still cooking on the inside as it's sitting. And then you go to a skillet or to like a black stone and get it blazing hot with some garlic butter and you flash fry it on each side for about one minute. So you got that texture and that that flavor on the outside. It is the best way to cook a steak and that's how I do it. Huh. With the ribeyes that come from Brown Piercy Cattle Company. They've been breeding registered uh, Angus cattle for generations with one thought in mind, quality beef for consumers. Their goal is to deliver prime graded beef directly to customers' homes more affordably than you can purchase them at the store. Better beef conveniently delivered at a lower price than the grocery store. Find them online at brownpiercycattle.com. We are excited to have this woman on the Papa Ron podcast for episode 35. I, um, if you If you recall... I'm trying to remember which episode it was, maybe episode 33 uh, with John Cantrell. Mm -hmm. Um, I I, I referenced this woman and it was through some friends of mine from my hometown who I've been connected with on social media, but hadn't seen in person for (sighs) several years. And I'm talking about Tiffany and Matt McManus. Um, I happened to run in, in into them at the event center in Topeka to see this boxing match. And they were like, yeah, we're here with our friend, Rachel. Um, And strangely enough, our guest today's name is very similar to my wife's name. Very. Like, couldn't be more similar. It couldn't. Did you know this? Did no. you see this? So, um, my name, my wife's name, maiden name, is Rachel Althaus. <laughs> and our guest today is Rachel Holthaus. Welcome to the show. Thank you. We're so excited to have you here. <laughs> it was pretty cool to be at that boxing event. One, just because I'm into sports and I love boxing. Or, I mean, I'm, I, I haven't never been to a boxing event, but I love competition. Yeah. And so, that was cool. And, uh, and it just turned out that while I was there, I was able to schedule two guests for the Papa Ron podcast, which was a complete write off. You know, every drink was basically <laughs> That's a what I was gonna say, every meal, write-off. all the gas, <laughs> the fuel, everything there was a, was a complete write off. So, uh, when, when Tiffany brought me over to see Matt, I started to ask them, you know, well, what, I guess I didn't really peg them for being people who would go to a boxing match. <laughs> be sitting on the floor close to the ring. Mm-hmm. Well, what brought you here? And they were like, well, our friend Rachel brought us here and found out that you were great friends with John Cantrell. And then from there, they said, you know, you need to really have Rachel on your podcast. She's got a remarkable story. So they brought you over. You started to tell your story and I started to be like, yeah, let's just book it. <laughs> you know, like, don't tell me too much. Yeah, let's save your breath. I yeah, want to hear. Yeah, exactly. Hear. Yeah. So, um, you, first of all, I want to tell you how much I appreciate you. Um, your kind of moniker is the hope dealer. Yes. And you are so positive, full of positive energy and, um, and and you've taken a negative and turned it into a positive and and been an inspiration and a motive and motivating, uh, influence to so many people's lives in and around the Topeka and beyond. 
uh, area. And, and so I guess, uh, first of all, I just wanted to say that, that I really commend you on your efforts. Um, but it started somewhere, right? Thank you. And I appreciate that. And I'll just say that, um, tag on to what you said, that it's a PhD in failure is what I say, <laughs> not just a mistake and turning it, you know, our negative situation and turning it positive. But yeah. I appreciate you saying it like that. I appreciate yeah. you, you acknowledging it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. um, let's get into it. Um, you, uh, where are you from? You know, how, how did, uh, how, I don't even know how to ask this, but, uh, wh- you, it, I remember it, you telling me the story basically that you had a family or married and you started to kind yeah, of go down a, a tough yeah. path. A, a, a timeline it is the easiest way, you know, to explain most stories. What I start with a lot is every human, every human has a story and has a story that has, uh, highs and lows, you know, and that is the common ground is just acknowledging that, you know, right. we've all been somewhere. We all have family histories that contribute to who we are and what we are. Mm-hmm. And then we go on and build our own happinesses, successes and failures all combined. So me, uh, I'm born and raised in Topeka. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, I, it was 1973, uh, I was conceived in the backseat of a barracuda is like what I like to, you <laughs> know, like every, a song or every kid has kind of this, this narrative of how they understand how they came to be. Usually it's not even the case, okay. but that is, you know, just kind of how I paint the picture. Mm-hmm. Um, my mother was 17 when I was born. She was um, raised very, uh, w- Southern Baptist is our background, okay. and it was, you know, pretty pretty stringent, uh, her mom was, on rules and things like that, so it was kind of a, not such a positive thing sure. that she was pregnant at 17. Sure. Uh, she did want to be a mother, and um, good time Charlie, I refer to as my dad, <laughs> he is, you know, he's he's a guy, you know, he's a fun person, he's that guy at the end of the bar that's friends with everybody. Yep. He's been married quite a few, several few times. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and, um, you know, so th- their thing didn't, wasn't sustainable. Uh, she married when I was four. I have two stepsisters. They were two and three when we got married or when they got married. And, you know, my journey kind of started out that way. I had heavy influence from my grandparents, hmm. uh, was very close with my grandmother And as I go along and tell you the things that happened, she was kind of my person. And when I lost her, I kind of, that's when I lost, uh, I lost my footing a little bit. She was just a person. She was not perfect. Um, but she was a, she was your person. She was a good ambassador of Jesus. And so I've always had my faith, even in my low spots, that was never in question. Okay. So, and as I go along, the love of my kids and my faith in God should have kept me from the things that I fell to, but that is not how life works, Mm -hmm. especially behind the veil of any type of mental illness or the the influence of substance. Mm-hmm. So okay. I just give that caveat. Um, and so how, for, forgive me if I mm-hmm. missed it. How old were you when your mom passed? When my grandmother, passed. Or grandmother, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, she, uh, let's see, I was, Oh goodness. I say the story starts 19 and a half years ago with my struggle with addiction. Okay. I began taking a sleeping pill. So I'm 48 now. So basically 29. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, back to I I was a, I was a good girl, really good girl. Uh in high school I was friends with everybody. Again, my faith was a big part of who I am, always has been. I could go to all the parties, you know. Uh I didn't drink, I didn't have sex, I didn't do drugs, but I had fun with everyone. I didn't judge anybody that did, and then I'd be at Sunday school. Mhm. And, you know, I tell my kids that now you can always have that balance of having fun and being cool, but Mm -hmm. make Jesus cool too. Right. (laughs) Right. Sure. So anyway, uh, I married my high school sweetheart. 
um, we started dating when we were 17, got married when we were 21, mm-hmm. and I always lived with my parents, uh, the man that raised me, my stepdad and my mm-hmm. mom, or then got married got and married, went yeah. immediately to living with my husband. Mm-hmm. I, I promised Ron that I was going to tie in something with each of you while I was here. So my K-State story comes in now. Okay. <laughs> um, I worked... Since I was 14, I, I've loved every job I've done. I worked in the pharmacy when I was 14 and uh, at Kmart. Mm-hmm. And I, I always knew that I was going to do something in healthcare. I always knew, I felt in my heart that God was going to give me a special needs child. Mm. I don't know why. Mm. I, I just, my heart was prepared in those ways. I knew I wanted to do an active um, job either in public service or caring for people, a mm-hmm. nurse, a doctor, something. Mm-hmm. Now, you could look at my uh, stellar grades and realize some of that was going to be a little bit tricky. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, there's a brain in there, but, yeah. you know, I if I got straight A's and doing my hair, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I'd have been straight to Harvard. Yeah, sure. But anyway. So, like it's hard. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but... Uh, so back to that job at 14, I was driving a 1979 Mercury Bobcat and I got home from that job at Kmart and I said to my dad, I said, who is FICA and why did they take all my money? Uh. <laughs> I'm looking at that paycheck, yeah, right? Yeah, you are, yeah. And so that began my understanding of what the Medicare Trust Fund is essentially and now Fast forward to being 49 years old. Since 38, I have been a recipient of disability. Mm. And I take that very seriously. I take the fiduciary responsibility very seriously. I am disabled uh, on paper, total and permanently disabled. Mm. And so there are so many things I can still do. Mm -hmm. I am still a nurse. I can still love. I can still care about people. I just twist it, do it in a different way, mm-hmm. and and I want that added to the list of when we ask kids, what do you want to do when you grow up? Be a teacher, a lawyer, a reporter, you know, a nurse, a doctor, a hope dealer. Mm. I have the best job. Mm. I have the best job. And the, the beautiful part about it is there's no financial motivation. Hmm. It isn't that... I want to have my own business and work for myself and build that. Like that's not even the business model. The business model is I go where I want. I do what I want. I love, I go with my heart Mm. and I share my story, not as much to help other people, but to keep myself alive. Yeah. And keep myself in the game. And we'll talk about intentional happiness because that's what I do every day. But anyway, back to, so find out about what FICA is. And I keep working. But, man, I loved every job I've ever done. I made friends everywhere I went. Mm -hmm. I've always been this big personality, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I saved money. My my parents were hardworking people. um, But it was clear that if I wanted to go on, after college or after high school, I was going to be paying for that on my own. Mm -hmm. And I was happy to do that. Things that I paid for, I was proud of. Mm -hmm. So I'd save money and I filled out my application. It was the spring of 1992. Okay. And I'd filled out my application for K-State, for the dorm, for Mm -hmm. everything. Took my ACT. It wasn't so stellar, but (laughs) that was still my goal. I'm getting there and I'm going to do my undergrad credits. Um, Potentially at that time for nursing, you know, I want to go to Baylor to nursing school. Okay. Well, I guess I'll re- rewind it before I was dating uh, my high school sweetheart because that happened our senior year. My goal was then I'm going to go to Baylor. I'm going to go to nursing school. I'm going to find a cowboy and it's all going to be. So anyway, it's so, like it. so life happens and that was the plan. Well, uh, my mother came to my job on a break and she said, can you take a little break and come out to the parking lot? Sure. Again, this is the spring of 1992. And she handed me the keys and a payment book to a brand new car. Wow. She 
always had, I believe, and I choose to believe, good intentions. But she parented me out of fear Mm -hmm. because of her own situations, her own traumas, Mm -hmm. you know, and that kind of thing. And she always said that I raised her. Mm -hmm. And I will say that I still Mm -hmm. take that role, Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. I still am raising her. We're kind of on a on a communication break for the time being that I'm, I am spreading my wings with the stuff with my hope dealing. So okay. anyway, but that doesn't change love. We can still love people. And sometimes we just need our space and that's okay. But anyway, she handed me the payment book and a set of keys. And she said, I'm afraid if you go to K state, you're going to get raped. Oh, and I really think you should stay home and go to Washburn. Wow. And I didn't, in even in my consciousness there was never speak back to my parents or you know not because of not because of extreme punishment or anything like that just respect yeah I just didn't Hmm. do that and Mm -hmm. I didn't know that I had the ability to say that's not what works for me Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I it began a really um angry person on the inside began then uh and for you know for that reason I should have spoken up it would have served her better it would have served me better mm. um but anyway, so you didn't go to K-State then I didn't you, go to you went to Washburn I went to Washburn I you should have said you know, God, don't you know that Washburn is so much more expensive <laughs> right right <laughs> Anyway, so I uh, I worked, but essentially the the deal is I I needed to go to school full time or go to work full time, yeah. Because it back then even it was a four hundred dollar car payment, yeah. And so, you know, there was some happy in there, but there was also some manipulation in there. Bless mm-hmm. her heart, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, but so I worked full time as a dental assistant, and I loved that job. And I went to school in the evenings, took some classes at Washburn, took some community college classes and, you know, was making my way that way. We got married uh, with my ex-husband. Now ex-husband had a semester left at K-State. And so I went from being in my parents' home, being married. He was finishing out his degree and uh, I was still working full time, going, going to school part time. And, you know, we go along, he, he graduates a couple months later. He's like, oh, this is just not for me. He got a park and resource management degree. Well, unless we were going to move to, you know, someplace that had a lot of parks really wasn't something that was going to work here. Mm, Or if he used it, it was always going to be weekends and holidays. So he decided to go back to be a teacher. And although I supported that, and nodded and smiled Mm -hmm. i was pissed off (laughs) because i hadn't gotten to go to school yet Mm -hmm. i never voiced that to him and and it wasn't uh directed at him it was just things inside of me that built up this people pleaser that nodded and smiled Mm -hmm. and inside i was getting mad yeah yeah so you you talked about the first topic with your with your mom right and so you were internalizing that Mm-hmm. evil mean angry spirit and now this thing with your husband happens and now you're internalized so we're starting to yeah it's it, starting to escalate it was building building yes, it but. was building this stellar liar that i was you know when john my sweet friend john kentrell was here and he talked to you about being a chameleon yeah mm-hmm. a person that has a tendency or a brain that is an addict type brain it, it, that was perfectly fitting we are we're mm-hmm. a chameleon mm-hmm. you know we okay. fit into this mold or that mold and then when you put substance on that type of brain it feels like this must be what it feels like for everybody else because now i can say what i want do what i you know mm-hmm. it's just an odd thing okay. so so that's that part uh we were married and had um great careers. I went to nursing school, got out. I started working at Stormont Vale in Topeka. I was a recovery room nurse. I loved it. Um, Built great friendships. In fact, that's when I met Tiffany, Dr. Tiffany McManus. Yes. (laughs) Because she's gone on to get her DNP. And uh, we worked together way back when Jesus was a baby. Anyway. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. You're, you're, you look pretty dang good for yeah. 2,000 years old. Goodness 
<laughs> so anyway, that that went on. So fast forward to um, 2003. Okay. And that's when I lost my grandmother. Again, she was my mm. person, mm-hmm. but I can see it not only with the lens of a healthcare professional, somebody that's had a lot of psychology in my past. I have a master's degree in um, healthcare leadership, a lot of study of human behavior. And she just always wasn't so nice to my mom Hmm. they had a very tumultuous relationship they loved each other they could laugh together but on a common ground of getting along on things they struggled and so it was hurtful to my mom for my grandmother to be so loving and kind to me Hmm. what I can see now Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you said your grandmother wasn't kind to your mom is that how you were not growing up she was very hard on her and that built a life that was just a difficult relationship so what was it that allowed you two to connect then because your grandmother did not you didn't have that same relationship with your grandmother well i was okay so back again 1973 um strict southern baptist here Mm -hmm. her daughter is pregnant Mm -hmm. and um my my biological father wanted her to have an abortion Mm -hmm. and and i know this because he is honest enough to tell me you know he Mm -hmm. says rachel i'm a selfish sob Mm. i should have never been a parent and it isn't because i don't love you it's just that's not me. Mm. He said, I'm not good at it. I didn't do it right. You know, and I'm sorry. Was he also young? Sorry about that. He was 18. Okay. Um, but you know, he's never even met my kids and I don't, I don't put that on him. I pray for God to give me a lens to see people, how he sees us. It took me a long time not to take that personal, like, Mm. well, sure. You know, that, it that, I was his firstborn. He's had m- more kids. I have siblings. Okay. But, it, you know, that that heart stuff took a while to get around. And my interpretation of it now is, thank you for being honest with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And taking that, you know, that's just who he is. It's not mm. personal to me. Okay. But that's a long time yeah, getting sure. there. That sure. took a while. A girl. Mm-hmm. So back to the question then, you're, you're, you're raised... Southern Baptist, I guess the, the question was, how was it that your mom and your grandmother had such a difficult relationship, but it was so easily for you to connect to your well, grandmother? I think my interpretation, and I'm qualified to say, because it's my life, <laughs> is <laughs> that it was her apology to her daughter to be kind to this baby that got yeah. on the scene. Yeah. My mother wore a crushed red velvet wedding dress wow and that's never been you know labeled as oh a scarlet letter but you know to me looking at the history and the narrative of it that's how I feel Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. that it was I was the baby under the red dress Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. and so um that's my interpretation that she loved me so much and I don't know if she felt like that was saying to my mom I'm sorry for treating you, judging you and treating you bad for, Mm -hmm. you know, being a teen mom and that kind of thing. I'm not sure, but that's how I choose to uh, reconcile it in my head. Okay. But she never could say directly to her, I I, love you. I'm proud of you. That kind of thing. And I was going to say from, from your, like how that's received, if that was the intention, Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that's how your mother received no, it. No. And probably probably didn't. No. Like she probably received that the opposite of that. That it was hurtful that, oh, you can be nice to her. Yeah. But you couldn't ever be nice to right. her. Right. Or things know. that she did. I remember when I graduated nursing school, she was so proud of me. And I opened my gift and it was a tiara. Mm. And she placed it on my head. And tickets to go to Alaska which a lot of my family are from Alaska so my husband and I could take a trip to Alaska and though I appreciated that no one in my family had gone to college except for my grandfather okay and uh, I appreciated it but I could feel that it hurt my mom's feelings Mm -hmm. you know because she never said I was I'm proud of you for anything right and my mom's love language was cleaning cooking for people sure you know acts of all service. those kind of acts of service mm-hmm. and you know it just really was unappreciated yeah, it puts you in a pretty tough position doesn't it yeah. yeah yeah 
So when your grandmother dies, that's when things start to spiral out of control? Yes. And I will say that it's just, it's the moment that chemicals got introduced to my brain. I t- started taking Ambien. Hmm. I was working a lot and I was taking a lot of call. And we kind of, as a small family, got used to that extra extra pay coming in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Did, and you, uh, you, so you talked about your small family. At that time, had, did you and your husband have one or two kids? Hmm. Good point. Uh, we were married six years before we got our first baby. I had a history of endometriosis. Mm. I had already had five surgeries for endometriosis mm. by the oh time my. I got my first baby. So she was, you know, a really welcomed. Sure. Uh, not surprised, but really welcomed experience because we didn't know for sure. Sure. And my mom herself had the same problems, had to have a hysterectomy at 27. Wow. I was the only baby she ever got. So oh. having me at 17 really worked out. Yeah. Because she had those same kind of troubles. Hmm. Uh, so, and then it was another six years before we got our second mm-hmm. tornado. <laughs> and I'm telling you, Aww. one is calm and the other is the storm. Okay. Mm. My oldest one is like her dad. She's disciplined. She's good with money. She's responsible. <laughs> and then my Molly is 15. Okay. And she made varsity cheer as a sophomore. Mm. And I kindly say it was obviously mostly personality based (laughs) okay (laughs) you you look at these situations you know i did drill team in high school but again i was good at doing my hair yeah Yeah. i wasn't in dance like all the other girls and but we need that we need a balance of roles like that in the school our leadership roles Mm -hmm. and so it it does it takes a balance of personality and skill sure Um, And I am proud to say that she, as a student athlete, has improved that a lot. She's a very strong base on her cheer team. And she she brings a lot of pizzazz to Good. those games. So awesome. I am proud of her. But she is, she's kind of got that wild spirit like her mama. <laughs> Good. So you guys are a small family, as you said. Yeah. And then that's when your grandmother had passed away. And we're, so where are you at? You're taking Ambien. You're getting the extra money from working overtime. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm, it's fueling. And it, it, almost immediately when I took Ambien, I took it and I was like not taking it to sleep. I was taking it to numb. Mm. And I was not a drinker again. Like I said, went to all the parties and whatever. I'd maybe been intoxicated in my lifetime two or three times. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so this was, whoa. But I also knew I'm a nurse. And I also knew that this is an issue to be taking it for the wrong intention. Sure. I told no one mm-hmm. and that was beginning of my secret. So here I am a liar because mm-hmm. I'm still this people pleaser mm-hmm. doing and going and smiling. And inside I'm mad about even some old stuff about college. Right. Okay. right. Not even directed at my mom, just myself. Like yeah. what the heck? Why can't you just speak up and s- say what you really feel? Sure. Mm-hmm. That was self-imposed. I have, you know, I've written a book and it, there is no one that I, uh, I, I don't defame anyone's character in the book except me. Mm. I'm okay. the problem. I would cry to my mom if my husband hurt my feelings or I'd cry to my husband if my mom hurt my feelings. Mm. That's normal stuff that happens. And I was the problem. You know, I created these webs of oh this hurt me but I didn't do anything about it and they're just little tiny things Mm -hmm. we do not have big problems as regular people in America we have access we've never been hungry those kind of things most of us and so that's why you know I just say it looking back you Mm -hmm. know at a a 50,000 foot view man people just tell the truth. 
yeah. anybody. So I like to give cliff notes on if that's you, if you're a people pleaser, you see some tendencies like mine, mm-hmm. just skip over that and just start being <laughs> right. authentic. Yes. Good, good, good. I so like what, so after being on the Ambien, does that lead to other substances? Well, you know, and this is again, rewind 2003. So we know a lot more about that drug now. You know, you might have heard of people eating in the middle of the night or ordering things online and they don't remember it until it comes like there is this amnesia effect but you are you can be completely awake and lucid while it's going on so it it has a black box label it's not a drug that's used widely anymore there might be certain instances Hmm. but I like to talk a lot about that because one of my my physician is a close friend of mine and she, you know, she would write the script with 11 refills for the year. Wow. Because as far as the drug reps tell them, it's non-addictive, non-habit forming. Right. You know, but the story and the cases got built. Sure. There were that takes people time. People that drive a car and didn't realize it. I mean, all kind of things. Yeah. But anyway, again, I'm taking accountability. I was a nurse. I knew. Mm-hmm. I knew I was. Yeah, you knew you, were, you knew you were abusing it. Yeah, I was mm-hmm. abusing sure. it. So it was the gateway to destroying my life because I thought the next incident that happened, I thought I invented, um, and this is only the second time that I'll be share that I have shared this in a, a public space because I don't ever want to plant the seed if someone hasn't thought, oh, I could do that. Hmm. Again, this is 2003. I'm a nurse. I'm a busy nurse Mm -hmm. in a recovery room setting. This is before barcoding. So you can kind of see where I'm going. This is before um, the pharmacy system in a hospital. You scan the patient's armband. You scan the drug. Mm. You give the drug. You waste the drug. What's not used, right? Mm. Back then, it was an honor system, essentially. Mm. And so I was a recovery room nurse, so Basically, acute pain is what we were treating. Yep. So there were any at any given time, there could be a bottle of fentanyl in my pocket, mm. or you know, Versed or Demerol back then, or you know, anything because that's that's what we did over and over. We were just medicating pain. So in between that, I had endometriosis. I I had a lot of painful, you know monthly time that kind of Mm -hmm. stuff I was still keep going I was having a little sadness because my grandmother all these things where you don't think a person that is a professed Christian a person that is a responsible person a person that has a uh, you know college degree and works hard and believes in rules and I compromised my own professional ethics and my own ethics as a human Mm -hmm. and I gave myself IV fentanyl that was to be wasted. Wow. Okay. So again, busy. We were busy. And there may only be two nurses working in an evening shift is what I worked. So the picture would be like three o'clock on a Friday afternoon or on a Friday afternoon. I worked one in the afternoon to 1130 at night, but we only staffed it till 11 30 at night so after 11 30 we covered with call from friday night to monday morning wow and so this is this is not out of the ordinary i could have gotten off work at 11 30 on friday night but then went on call and been on call till 7 a.m monday morning and this is before there's mandates of how many hours you can work in a row right how many anything so i could Come in at one eight or one in the afternoon on Friday and not go home till seven o'clock Monday morning. Wow. And you can ask Dr. McManus. That is true. And it happened. And so when I, why I say that is because you need another nurse with you to witness the wasted portion of the medication that you didn't use. Okay. Um, a vial would come, fentanyl, for example, two hundred and fifty mm-hmm. micrograms in a vial. The dose that we typically would give a patient is 25 to 50 mics per, you know, 15 minutes or hour or something. Mm -hmm. 
So that's that's a large volume. Mm-hmm. And so each patient, they would have their own medication taken sure. out, assigned sure. to them, and then we would waste the leftover. So I could walk around with a lot of narcotic in my pockets mm. because you only have that one other nurse to go with. Best case scenario always is you're doing that stuff immediately, but that's not how the real world works. Mm -hmm. We could have anybody from a baby having a craniotomy, you know, on a ventilator going to the pediatric intensive care unit or, you know, an old person with a fractured hip that doesn't have any family with them, no one to sit with them. They're sad. You're consoling them because they're in pain. They're trying to get out of the bed. I mean, there's a lot of things, variables. Sure. Okay. And so... Anyway, so in that time, I, I compromised my professional and moral ethics because I had this access, mm-hmm. okay? Still knew it was wrong. I had not seen that in a registered nurse. I had seen it in uh, anesthesiologists and CRNAs because, again, they had access to all of those things. Um, that was several times I had seen that. They entered a, you know, recovery type program, professional program, and were able to continue working is the experience I had with it. When it was, it was a short period of time that that happened for me and the safety net of my people around me lovingly knew that there was something wrong. Mm. And how long did that take from the, from the time you started taking it? to the time where people started asking questions. Cause I was actually thinking about that earlier while you were talking, like surely other nurse or people around the hospital had to be kind of picking up being like, Hey, what's going on here? And right. so how long did it take? Right. It was, it was only a few months. So mm-hmm. when I say 2003 is when my grandmother died and I started taking Ambien, mm-hmm. that was nothing that was every day. It was, I'm busy, 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 you know, but when I get to Friday night or Thursday night, ah, I can take a couple, one mm-hmm. of those, and then, you know, a couple throughout the weekend and just kind of Get you through. zone out. Because sure. I was not, like, we I, we didn't even drink beer in our house or wine right. or anything. So the vials of the fentanyl, um, so I guess I'm trying to visualize how you're actually using this fentanyl. Well, that's a good question. So um, Without getting caught. Right, like you're not gonna. Are you taking it home and then taking stick? It you're sticking it. You're take, sticking yourself in take, the while you're in the bathroom. Taking it home. Okay. Taking it home, and I'm drawing it up and injecting it into. Oh wow! A muscle at first. Okay. And then Is, do they typically just do it? It's a drip, right? When you're in the hospital, so it's just going into your bloodstream. It's going into so you have an IV when you have surgery, right? Right. And it has ports along the way, so sure. it's not hanging in a bag. But we come behind you and have a syringe with a dose in it of whatever, and slip it into, you know, and it's yeah. and okay. it's and it's sensationalized, you know. Prior to surgery, you know, they're slipping you a Mickey and this is, oh, this is the good stuff. And you see these videos of kids that have their wisdom teeth out and, you know, we're laughing because it's so funny how they're talking crazy because they're high and Mm -hmm. all that stuff. But I mean, it's essentially, that's what it is. When you push an IV drug like that very fast, there, there is a, a sense of euphoria. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, but I was injecting it in, in my muscle. Wow. Um, how much were you taking at a time? Uh, there, and, there was a tolerant, there was a quick tolerance that built up to that. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it could be quite a bit. <clears throat> I'm trying to like, mm-hmm. my son has a double ear infection right now. <clears throat> and so he's on uh, amoxicillin. Mm-hmm. And so we have to give him, I think it's five milliliters uh, f- on from a syringe. Yeah. Right. So like that, that seems like a pretty big dose. If I were to ask you to kind of in comparison to uh, five milliliters, 
was it a dose bigger than that? I, how potent is fentanyl is really what I'm okay. trying to understand. Fentanyl, like, is this a huge no, syringe it, and you're just and, pumping and are you doing and it, it every hour or is it once a day? And it's, and it's a good question because of the epidemic that we have in this society. Yeah. We hear about fentanyl laced in pills that people take and different things like that. So obviously an IV situation is completely different. The general public does not have access to something like that. Correct. Um, so let me equate it to a lower tab. Okay. Okay. So a five or a 7.5 milligram pain pill. Okay. okay mm-hmm. is, is probably about equal to a 50 microgram dose of fentanyl. Okay. Okay. So that's a pain pill to mm-hmm. a dose. And when I explained that to you, it was a 250 microgram vial. Vial. Yeah. So there's that many doses are you doing in it in the one? Are you doing it twice a day, once a day? How often are you taking? So, so again, this was an intermittent, short lived thing, but I would give myself a hundred and like 150 micrograms at a time, maybe something like that. Wow. Yeah. And still be able to walk and talk. Okay. But wow. that was daily. And that was not daily. That was not daily. But it was an it was enough to augment my personality, mm. uh, change the way I behaved. What was it doing to your personality? Your personality was it was it making you dull? Mm. No, it was making you hyper. So there is there's two <laughs> schools of thought of of people's reaction to drugs, and I. And I like to use a Benadryl example because that's a common place yeah. where everybody can kind yeah. of come back together. There, people either take a Benadryl and they fall asleep and yes. they're out. Yes, that's me. Or they take it <laughs> and it makes them wired. Okay. Okay. So John that you met, John Cantrell, yep. right? Yep. Yeah. He and I are in the club. Okay. We're in this. Our brain chemistry is that. If we take those kind of things, it's like, let's go. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> so, Nonstop. <laughs> exactly. So, okay. and, and that's the feeling that you're after. If you're a risk taker, thrill seeker. Yeah. That Adrenaline thing. junkie. Okay. Yeah. Is that, this may be a dumb mm-hmm. question. I may regret asking this. Um, is that what Michael Jackson was taking a lot of? Well, what Michael Jackson, um, the reports that yeah. the way yeah, he yeah. died is. I mean, what did he tell you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Were you his nurse? Were well, you his we nurse? had lunch last week. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> well, that's, wow. uh, next week on the Papa Ron podcast. Well, because I mean, you know, Michael just like Jackson El- is just alive. like Elvis. Is Elvis, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, but so based on the reports, Diprovan is the substance that oh, okay. that uh, ended his life. Okay, and so if you've had surgery in recent years. It is a white, milky substance that's given to you at the induction of going to sleep. Hmm. Um, if it, anybody listening will probably resonate with some people, it, it's a deep ache in your arm hmm. when you feel this this medication go in, and it is an amnesia effect. Hmm. Um, and so that's what that is. So no, okay. that's that was a good question though. Was it, was it, am I, am I connecting something wrong? Was it ever reported that that's what I, I was thinking? That yeah. Was a fentanyl yeah. Thing that no, is, it was, it was reported. Now, it, I mean, I think there was a myriad of drugs right, in his probably, system, yeah. mm-hmm. but, uh, if, if it's not in a safe controlled environment, that drug is only to be used at induction when going to sleep for anesthesia or on a drip in the ICU given to keep someone sedated oh wow so monitoring their airway and their breathing is crucial for at the forefront yeah you know so so i have another question before we move on and we're going to take a little break here in just a second so everybody can get a drink um the you said you didn't take it daily Uh, you called it micrograms is that what it was yes and i think that's important because fentanyl is way more potent than morphine right and so it is that's why i'm blown so it that's, is I'm, it is micrograms so it's it's the equivalent a very very small amount of it mixed in the medium that's that is the vessel 
Okay. Oh, okay. So there's there's a carrier. So so for this for the IV medication, it's just you know, it's that's the amount is all you're giving is a very very small amount of fentanyl. You're pushing some saline with it, that kind of thing. Gotcha. But um, so is a it, microgram like a? Um, are there a hundred micrograms in a milligram? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So okay. you just move the zero, the yeah. decimal point yeah, over. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. I had to go back for a no, second. I'm like, oh, that's like, shoot, that's, a thousand. No, it's a hundred. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, that's, so, a, that's a good way to no, say No, that's it. what okay. I'm trying to figure out is try yeah. to get all yeah. the clarity. So, so this will help. So so the same kind of situation, say it's a hip, if somebody had a fractured hip, okay. we would push maybe two milligrams of morphine mm-hmm. as opposed to 25, 25 50, micrograms. 75 micrograms sure. of fentanyl. Okay. Sure. But you weren't doing this every day. So what I'm trying to understand then is is if you did this and was, let me back up. Were you doing this going into the weekend to help you get through the weekend? Right. Was that, was that when you would take the fentanyl? I, I will say because my work schedule was so erratic, Mm -hmm. um, I was also, um, PRN, I was the house supervisor for the hospital. Okay. So I had a position that, you know, it just covered a shift, but it would be the person that, say, a baby was coming from Fort Riley in distress and needed uh-huh. to be into the NICU, yeah. scheduling what bed was used. We have a trauma in the emergency department, and we need an extra person down there to record uh, the events, things like that. So I'm working as a recovery room nurse, have call, and PRN, I'm house supervisor. Okay. So it would be could be whatever could be got off work and it's two in the morning and give myself some, you know, trying. So you only took it as needed. And it wasn't needed (laughs) as you thought it was. That's what I meant. Did you take it to get through work shifts like for energy or did you take it for like, I want to enjoy my time at home and get things done. And so I'm just going to be like, yeah, I was good time. Rachel, I was taking it. it, This is short lived only a couple of months. Yeah before the patterns that I had as a person Mm -hmm. got picked up on. Mm -hmm. And again, like I said, lovingly, um, the people that I worked with um, came to me and I was allowed to resign and go into the Kansas Nurse Assistance Program, which is not a scary thing, which is um, something down the road I want to talk at nursing schools and I, mm-hmm. I have a connection at um, KU talking to residents as they're getting out of school too because it's just something we don't talk about enough uh, just that there is a potential you know you could be just starting your career and absolutely no one would think that that is something they would ever that would ever cross their mind mm-hmm. but it is a good thing to be prepared ahead of time to know that this could happen to people around you. Mm-hmm. Situation awareness is a really uh, good skill to have mm-hmm. and and really monitoring other people. We're with people we work with often more than we're with our family. Exactly, yeah. And we were a family. You're in a family when you're in a high-risk, high-reliability rel- situation. And, you know, save an ass in and or limb on a daily basis or some whatever kind of crazy <laughs> term we would use, yeah. you know, it, it, you get really close to people that you work with in those intimate situations. And so them picking up on it and, and handling me gently was, was absolutely medicine to my soul hmm. because I, I knew that was wrong, but I wasn't using my voice and speaking up and saying, Hey, you know, telling on myself. Yeah, mm-hmm. Sure. Of course. So I, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse and I apologize, but I just, I, I, I'm really interested in trying to understand you only took it as you felt like you needed it. What were the, so your symptoms were you're tired, you're groggy, no. you need a boost. What was it that was? Pit- no, the, 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 no. And was, how long uh, when you took the, I wasn't f- needing it. I was needing the, the euphoria. Oh. That was the only intended the purpose. Euphoria. Okay. I had, I had some pain like any other person would have. I had cramps because I had this problem Mm -hmm. with endometriosis and that was real and it was true and I was busy and I was working and that was the first thing that tipped me over while I'm hurting and I gave myself some medicine. No, it, then it was straight to, I want to feel that feeling. Okay. But it kind of, 
Am I wrong in understanding that it doesn't do both? It gives you the euphoria, but it also relieves you from the pain? Yeah. Right. Okay, that's what I was trying to understand. And it was it, relieving the pain right. of me suppressing my voice. And how long would that, how long would it last when you took 100 micrograms? I mean, would that give you four hours no, of? No, no. I mean, not not long. Um, it, it, it wears off quickly. Um, so when, when you take uh, an opiate in pill form, it lasts longer. It stays with you longer. Mm -hmm. Things that are ingested different ways in your body have shorter half. The drug has the same half life, okay. but the modality of delivery is different. And so, you know, you might have that euphoric feeling and that relief of whatever type of pain for, you know, a window of three to four hours and then that's it. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's take a little break here for just a second and we're going to come back and then I want to kind of understand what happens after you resign, what the next step is after that. And then what really, uh, what, what happens next? Because the, there's a lot more to this story that we haven't touched on. It's coming up here in just a moment. It's episode 35 with Rachel Holthouse on the Papa Ron podcast. You're listening to the Papa Ron podcast to contact us with questions, comments, or interest in sponsoring the show. Find us online at paparonradio.com. Downloading. Now back to the show. Here again are your hosts, Ronnie Phillips and Jillian Gregg. Make sure you're following us on all the social platforms, and then also be sure to check out cleanabsolutelyflawless.com. Clean AF, clean polish, protect, special, spe <laughs> let's try that again, specifically <laughs> formulated to protect and beautify surfaces, including plastics, vinyl, rubber, and carbon fiber. Water resistant formulation is safe for use on gloss and matte finishes, makes for a clean up process easier by forming a durable coating that repels mud, dirt, and debris. Apply and lightly buff to a dry sheen. Perfect for all power sports enthusiasts clean absolutely flawless.com if you haven't noticed if you're watching the video version of the pop around podcast on spotify or youtube i got this thing going on here with my right eye can we zoom in on that yeah can you right here i'm surprised you didn't yeah. wear just wear your glasses to kind of cover it up well i actually thought about it but i thought that might just part of my french just look real douchey <laughs> and i didn't want to do that i'll save my uh, comments yeah yeah well because i i, I look that way all comments. the way all I'll the save all, it. anyway anyway so um and sometimes it's hard once i take the the eye glasses off because of the headphones to jam them back in yeah. there again and so i'm trying to read this copy and it's not working out for me because my vision is already crap and then it's even worse today anyway back with rachel holthouse um <laughs> it's called real life that's what yeah, it is it's really I mean, what it is that's the deal um so you're uh, you've been asked to resign because they catch you basically stealing um fentanyl and but they did it with it sounds like some sort of grace right like they uh, were all 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 grace yeah all and, grace and with tears with i mean it's completely outside of my character mm -hmm. you know and like i said i i thought that i invented it because i never knew of another nurse to do that mm -hmm. And a, C a CRNA or an anesthesiologist, yes, I had friends that that crossed that line on, you know, working so many hours and ended up giving themselves this stuff too. But I hadn't seen it in a staff nurse, mm -hmm. so um, you know, I was I was sad for a lot of reasons. I was sad for the shame it would bring to my family. I was sad for the shame it would bring. It was bringing to. You know, a lot of people that knew and loved me. That's where I was at with the feeling at that point. Um, and at this point, you were still married. Yes. And you had one child. Yes. Okay. Yes. And so, how do you break it to your husband that you just got busted for stealing fentanyl? Well, again, this is this is all a very very uh, dynamic story behind the scenes. You know, I. I lost my grandmother. She was my person. I was having a hard time. My mom didn't allow me to set foot back in her house. Mm -hmm. um, in, into my grandmother's house. That hurt me very badly. Mm -hmm. My husband was the closest person to me, and he knew that. Um, and his, you know, modality of emotion, it was just different than mine. And so... 
if we hug Rachel and we give in to, you know, that she's this really sensitive person, I think he was always just afraid of that. And so he, there was no give. Mm. There was no acknowledgement that I was, I was in a rut and I was struggling, you know, no hug, no anything. And I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative about him. That's just who he is as an emotional being. That's just not in his, in his repertoire. Right. Okay. And so I needed, I needed my life partner to care that I was hurting that badly. I was upset that that wasn't being acknowledged. And again, that is not, you know, anything to begrudge him. It's just studying why and how mm-hmm. I got, sure. I got the way I did without blaming him. I, I should have just spoken up. I should have, if anybody is listening that has this type of thing and they see this collision coming on, I could have raised my hand and said, in a controlled situation, I need to go into um, an employee assistance program of some some type. I need some counseling. I need some therapy. I need to take a break Mm -hmm. from running this rat race. And I I just need a break because, obviously, I didn't want to hurt my kids. I didn't want to beat your kid. I didn't want to be away from my my little girl, mm-hmm. you know, my Emma was four at that time mm-hmm. and the light of my life. And so, you know, just a, in hindsight, you know, when we look at those things and just like my husband, if he could look at it, he, he probably picked up on a lot of signs that he didn't admit to, yeah. sure. you know, and he could have said, I don't know what to do, but somebody helped us crazy ass. You know, yeah. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> right. Sure. You can always look back with hindsight. Sure. For sure. You know, and but, so, but so in that very, moment, mm-hmm. what happened? You came home and said, and did it, you, did it, you, were you truthful or did you say, Hey, I left my job. It was just time. No, or- no. I, I went home and pulled the covers over my head and which was a pattern, you know, I was in, it's obviously I was depressed yeah. mm-hmm. and I had been pulling the covers over my head for quite some time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I just, I said, I've been let go. And, you know, it was, we, we knew, but we didn't talk about that. I had this problem, mm-hmm. you know, even with the sleeping pills, we, we just, we, at that point we weren't talking about it. So I go into the Kansas Nurse Assistance Program. Well, hold up just a second. Mm-hmm. So you go home and you tell him that and you tell him that you've been let go, but you don't tell him why you were let go. Oh, yeah, I did. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, yeah, And And it was just like, okay, there was no anger from him. There was no, I guess what I'm trying to get is a, a better understanding of his emotion to or reaction to you coming clean about that. Well, that's, I mean, that's a whole story. There, There isn't... There wasn't emotion there. um, I'm sure he was angry, um, but we handled our emotions completely different. There was never any, in in a 22 year marriage, 28 years now running um, relationship, essentially, because we're we're co-parents, we're still in a Mm -hmm. relationship. We just are very, very, very different people. I'm very sensitive, very emotional, all those mm-hmm. things. And he's very regimented and very much, you don't talk about personal things with anyone, including mm-hmm. your spouse. Okay. So he never shared his own feelings with me, let okay. alone consoled me on mine. So there wasn't a conflict wow. then, is basically what I was trying to get at. Is no, sort of trying I to mean, understand. He, wasn't, he wasn't happy. Well, he, no. You know, but- he wasn't happy, but there wasn't like... There wasn't like, oh, we're getting divorced or anything like that. Sure. You know, it was like, okay, this is what's going on, and I'm getting a, jo- I'm, I'm finding another job, and mm-hmm. we're gonna move on. I was quickly, I was employed, you know, within a few weeks, okay. and um, had a wonderful job, and I went on to do quality improvement in an office setting. So going into this Kansas nurse assistance program. So any employer assistance program at any level, whether it's a physician, um, CRNA, what, whatever it is in these types of things, there's a lot of people in these programs. And so it was three years that I had to meet with a group of peers 
once a month and, you know, talk about how things were going. Uh, I went into outpatient treatment okay. for opiate dependence. Hmm. I was shocked and again, should have spoken up. I needed a higher level of intervention than outpatient treatment. Okay. 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 So, so had you, did you, that three years, were you not using it, like abusing any substances? Oh no, that three years. No, no, you were clean. completely. But, but there is um, monitoring for that going on okay. and those things keep people safe and sure. allow them to get healthy at the same time. Sure. Those three years were wonderful. I obtained my master's degree. I was working like crazy and and you had that accountability. Yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. yeah. It, and that accountability felt good. So my question then is, is that you've basically admitted that, and you use John as an example, that your, your, your brain is wired to be, um, or to have addictive personalities, right? And mm -hmm. so you've, you've already started now down this road right? where you're taking these substances to mask certain pains, physical pains or emotional pain. Right. Um, and then all of a sudden you get fired and, or I'm sorry, you resign you were asked to but, resign but it's, yeah. yeah and and then you're you're moving over you're going through this i'll call it therapy and so it sounds like it's just cold turkey for three years then just like wham bam this happens and then you're cold turkey I, you're saying that there was nothing that you were doing then through all of the physical and emotional pain that you were going through no. that help you through those no. no and i i like what you say so there's also when i say two two responses to a substance for me there's also two types of addict Okay. You know, I was not a person you see hanging out in a bar, you mm -hmm. know, uh, running that fast life like John explains. And then he got mm -hmm. liked pool and then he, you know, was was yeah. hustling people in pool and mm -hmm. he was the fun guy and mm -hmm. what my use was hidden yeah. in the dark, in the closet. Like mm. I, I was in the closet of my bedroom, in my bathroom, in right. dark places. You know, and eat, but this is the same thing. You think nobody knows. Everyone knows at some level, you know, they're going to figure that out. My drug dealer was just the pharmacy, you know. Yeah. I wasn't asking even any of the times of the sleeping pills or anything. I wasn't even asking for refills, anything. It was just available. It is available mm. because that's just mm -hmm. Americana. Yeah. So what were you doing in it? Because you, the, 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 the emotional and physical pain doesn't just go away or hadn't gone away, right? You're still dealing and grieving from your grandmother's death. You were still having the issues with endometriosis. And what were you doing or how did you handle so, those that issue? So I had, I, I had uh, I'm in the nurse assistance program. So I'm going there once a month with peers. I'm right. in the treatment program, outpatient I thrive in treatment settings okay. because I, people are nice to me. I, it's loving. It's kind. Mm -hmm. I'm that with, was your drug. I'm with other misfits. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Know, fair I, enough. I like hanging out with people like me. Okay. I think that often, you know, I think there's a lot more people walking around us that have the same type of tendencies whether they're admitting it or whether they realize it or not. Mm -hmm. But I especially love the ones that either have been vulnerable on their own to be in a, you know, 12 step program or whatever they're in, or have encountered a process that has made them become accountable and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And, but then there's also the double edged sword with that, that I'm a deeply empathetic, emotional person. And, taking on somebody else's stuff is mm. very, very much a potential for me. Mm. So with all of my stuff, I do not begrudge anyone who uses whatever type of modality to be sober, right? My, this is me. This is my story. It's my mm -hmm. own thing. Yeah, yeah. And I was never addicted to any particular substance. Okay. For me... All of my use, all of my stuff was a symptom of my brokenness. Mm -hmm. And I was the only one who had the power to change that. Right. You know, all along the way, there's different examples of, you know, you know 
My husband took me to meetings. My mother-in-law took me to all my doctor's appointments and meetings, and she would sit with me. My parents did the same thing. You know, Mm -hmm. my sister has been there for me. Friends have been there for me. The person themselves has to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And some people will get that this side of heaven, and some people will get it not this side of heaven. Right, right. So for three years, then things are going pretty well. You're finding people who are kind of like you. They're in their, you're, uh, you're connecting and there. That's kind of becoming your new drug, if you will, that's, or your painkiller, I guess I'll call it that. Mm -hmm. Um, so things are looking good until they don't. And then, but then I'm also kind of getting addicted to, you know what? I'm, I'm loving this job. I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm killing it because what I've loved every job I've been in. It's kind of similar to some of the stuff John told you too. Yeah. Like, I'm like, I'm the guy. Mm -hmm. I'm traveling all over Kansas doing public speaking about prevention of harm and patient safety in the hospital setting, using my experience as a a nurse in the operating room and recovery room, Mm -hmm. you know, working on that stuff, speaking to large groups of people, often a few people in the room that know what has gone on with me, and they're still, you know, paid to be an attendee at the thing and whatever, right? Right. So that's going on. I have um, Molly, my second baby, during that three-year accountability time. Okay. Okay. I had to take Clomid to get her, which is a fertility drug, and had a couple of miscarriages during that time that were, you know, Mm -hmm. hard to get through, but that's life. People do. Yeah. So um, then, so that goes on my supervisor at my job, the Kansas Foundation for Medical Care is where I worked. It is the entity that oversees and does peer review for physicians where we were a Medicare funded organization. Mm -hmm. So on a contract, we're ensuring that a certain level of quality of care is given, right? And just, um, working with individual teams inside hospitals to work on patient falls or things that are never events. You know, you're never supposed to be given the wrong medication. You're never supposed to fall in a hospital. You're never supposed to have certain disease processes, the ones that are hospital acquired, Clostridium Mm -hmm. difficile, C. diff, those types of things. That's what I was working on. Um, My immediate supervisors knew of me having to be in that program because they had to sign off that I was complying in my job, mm-hmm. you know, and I wasn't giving any kind of meds in that job. This was a very much a, a business setting mm-hmm. and I was doing lots of traveling within the state and to Baltimore to the headquarters for Medicare, you know, saying what a good job we do here. I, I'm blowing down the road, calling the CEO to XYZ hospital. We have 84 critical access hospitals at that time in Kansas, more than any other state in the nation, these tiny hospitals. And I'm an advocate for people want to have care where they live. We do a good job. And they, you know, I'd have this anger when I'd be on the East coast because somebody, they would put a physician in the, in the job that I would do and they couldn't get in to see the CEO. Mm. How do, we don't get it. How do you do that? Uh, Cause it's Bob and he's lives next to a cornfield, just like me. And we go out mm-hmm. to lunch and we say, what the hell is this about? And you need to fix that. And okay. And let's work together to do that. And cause we had great, we had great numbers, sure. but we have people in Kansas, in the Midwest that are, you know, good salt of the earth people and nobody gets in healthcare to hurt anybody. Sure. And the way that we would go about it is just kind of like that, like uh, put put non-slip socks into a pack of supplies that you open up for a for a new patient room, mm-hmm. and just assume everybody's going to fall down. Let's just do it that way. I right. had a fr- I had a friend at a Kansas City hospital that did that, and now he's widely hugely successful. But he had a great idea, you know. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I think that. People, people saw value in me at every mm-hmm. turn of my story. People still saw value in me, even though I, you know what? I screwed some stuff up, mm-hmm. but I know that God always saw value in me. I never lost sight of that. Okay. Okay. So what, what happens at the end of that three years? 
You're killing it at work. Yeah, that I get. You have a new baby. I, I have a new baby. I get my master's degree completed. I'm still going. I'm outside yeah. of that accountability. I'm still. I'm still going. Are you still grieving from your grandmother? I mean, you've had this chance to have therapy with this during this three years. Do you ever bring up the? the psychological issues that you're having with the pain and the grief of your grandmother dying? I mean, where are you at emotionally? So, so it's coming into play. Um, I am again, never been addicted to a substance, but I like substance. So I would, when I'd be out of town working, I was smoking, Okay. uh, you know, spraying for breeze on my clothes and trying to cover it up when I came mm-hmm. home. I wasn't addicted, but I liked that feeling Mm -hmm. um started a little bit drinking casually doing that which I had never really done in my life and so again it just it doesn't matter it can move around it could be any different thing sure so uh but there was an event in my family and this part I don't disclose the details of because it is it involves minor uh, at that time, minor children in my family. And okay. so for their privacy, I don't disclose what it was. But we can all assume, let me just say, it was a hurtful thing. Okay. Broke my heart. Mm-hmm. Broke my entire family apart. Mm-hmm. It's this, this is going on, going on 13 years that mm-hmm. we haven't had a family function, family dinner, nothing together. Because mm. of this one particular it event? A, it was a do or die thing, right? Mm. So then here we go. We we got So a, now you're grieving again. We got an event. Yeah. We're grieving yeah. again. Got some trauma. And we have this married couple, myself and my ex-husband, this mm-hmm. highly emotional creature and this uh, show your love language by doing your job, getting your things done in order and mm-hmm. you move on. You suck it up, right? Yeah. That didn't go well. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, so this is where I, I had back surgery again, anytime that could, could come up a substance collide with something emotionally going mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. And here we go. It's a recipe for disaster for Rachel. Sure. Right. I had three discs removed from my back. Mm. Uh, about nine months before my big car accident i was trying to catch my daughter she was coming down the driveway on rollerblades and we had a really steep driveway and she was like 11 and i should have just let her wipe out but i could you know i was like no and i tried to catch her well we ended up tangled up together and her rollerblades were under my back Mm. and it was just it was an immediate thing within two weeks i had three discs taken out of my back wow so uh, so then they so, put you on a substance. So I was still on, uh, or so I was taking pain medicine, but it was the first time I had taken Soma, which was, is a muscle relaxer that's not prescribed anymore. Okay. Mm. And I liked the feeling that that gave me even better than a lot of other the stuff. The fentanyl and stuff. Huh? So mm. how long does this surgery and this, uh, we'll call it event, uh, take place after the three years uh, that you were going through the assistance, whatever you called it. Okay. So is that a couple of years later after yeah, all of that? A few, okay. a few okay. years later. So in the in-between time I was smoking when I was sad and talking yeah. to my grandmother, have a glass of wine every yeah. once in a while, yeah. but, but nothing really out of control. Mm-hmm. So then, but this event was my back mm-hmm. and now I'm off work for a little bit. I'm laying down. I'm mm-hmm. taking, I'd had a hysterectomy in between there also. But, okay. So kind of, you know, had some pain pills for that too. Uh, but off of it and back to work and doing okay. But then when I had my back surgery, mm -mm. it was this time of this. It doesn't happen like this anymore because there is a better uh, restraint or a better um, flow on how narcotics are prescribed. Yep. But at that time, I didn't have to look anybody in the eye and say, can I get a refill of this muscle relaxer? And I had three level back surgery. I was back to work driving a lot. You know, I, I did have pain. I mean, that is not, that is not, um, made up, but 
Pain is such a relative thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's never so anything mean you, where we needed this level of narcotics right. that have ever been given to people, ever. That's where I was going to go with it. It was, no. was it something that could have been Tylenol. suffered with Tylenol. ibuprofen is what I was going to say. Yeah. And you, okay. So do you become addicted to this then or reliant upon it? And what is it doing for you? Is, I, it, is it numbing you from all the emotional pain as well? I think, I think a... Um, a voluntary a voluntary reliance is, is is a good way to say it. I was okay. never addicted to it. And okay. I can say that now in hindsight after, you know, this car wreck, I've had 38 times to the operating room with this. Wow. So I know what being dependent and addicted to opiates as opposed to taking them at will for numbing. And so at that time it was still numbing. Um, But the muscle relaxers, so this is where it comes into play is the big problem. We have this event in my family, a private thing that's broken everyone's hearts. Take that muscle relaxer. I, it was the first time that I had suicidal thoughts. It lowered my inhibitions in that space. Mm. So that's what I talk about a lot is I always had my faith. I, the love of my kids was always enough in my family to not entertain suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. But that's not how life works, especially if there's any untreated mental illness or substance abuse. Uh, And for me, when I took, so I was depressed, whether people could tell I was or I wasn't, clinically depressed, absolutely. And then uh, taking this SOMA, this muscle relaxer lowers my inhibitions to entertain suicidal thoughts. I still had the prescription for Ambien also. Mm, and you're mixing it. Mm-hmm. Mm. So, so I can't remember the details of my car accident, but I will tell you January uh, 26, 2013 is where we'll skip to. And what I can tell you is every time, this is nine months after the back surgery, but I'm still... Every couple of weeks, you just call the pharmacy and they just fax your doc and they just, it's mm-hmm. just there. And there at that time, there was just no problem. So, so on I, January 26, 2013, you get behind the wheel of a car and you start premeditating your own life uh, or was, premeditate it, the it, end it, of your life? It was premeditated more than that because I had bribed my five-year-old to stay home. Mm. I promised her that I would bring her a Sunday from McDonald's if she stayed home because her, any time that I went to the office on the weekend, this was a Saturday, she went with me. My kids were always with me if I wasn't at work. And my older daughter had an ear infection. We had gotten to take a trip to Mexico, which was a first time for us as a family. We'd just gotten home the Wednesday before my wreck. And um, being in the ocean a lot and whatever, my daughter had a tendency for ear infections. So she had an ear infection. Mm -hmm. And she was somebody that got car sick easy. So I had taken her to the doctor that morning, had her ear looked at, got a prescription for antibiotic for her ear infection, took Mm -hmm. her home, laid her on the couch. Mm -hmm. So a regular scenario is the five-year-old would have been coming with me because I needed to go to the office, get my laptop, get things. I had three presentations the next week to write, you know, traveling to get back to. So I dropped the prescription off at the pharmacy, talked my five-year-old into staying at home with her sister. And so I, that's why I know the premeditation is there because I cannot remember the specifics of this now. Before you get to that mm-hmm. point, you touched on Mexico. Were you happy oh, when oh, you were oh, in Mexico? Oh. Like I, everything? Oh, oh, I'm so glad you said that because in the airport in Mexico, there's a pharmacy. <laughs> of course there is. And they sell bottles of Soma. Oh my gosh. And so... So, okay, so we, that, that does, that obviously is counterproductive for you. Uh, it's not good for you. Uh, no, and my, and my husband was completely unaware and I snuck off to go potty or whatever at the airport Mm. and I bought a bottle of muscle relaxers and I do know that I was taking them on the plane and on up until 
three days later when I had my car wreck. So it was outside the scope of my prescription, obviously. Mm-hmm. And it it's in Mexico. I right. don't know. Who knows, what's Who knows, in knows that? what was in it, but it sure. was sold in a pretty airport in the pharmacy. Yeah. And it says Soma. Were you suicidal while you were in Mexico? I mean, you're, you're in a beautiful place. Everything's going good. Like, are you having suicidal thoughts then too? I'm, I'm having, I'm having, they were not true homicidal thoughts, but the, the event that was so hurtful was an event that would evoke okay. both of those feelings. So this is happening daily. Like the, 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 all, uh, all the time. All right. So then let's go fast. We're forward. still walking through this issue in our family and no, it, nothing was good. It was terrible. Yeah. And I'm apologize that I keep asking questions that no, we'll keep bringing okay. that up. I'm just trying to find clarity on the timeline of how everything happens. And so you ask your daughter to stay home. Mm-hmm. And Promise ice cream. Promise ice cream. And yeah. so, and so when you, pr- okay, mm-hmm. when you, when you promised that, because you got upset when you started to say that mm-hmm. earlier. So you knew, were you aware in that exact moment or was it subconscious that you were asking her to stay home? Did you know I'm not bringing her ice cream back? Well, I, it's a couple things. I know that I'm taking these pills and I shouldn't be driving, number mm-hmm. one. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I shouldn't be driving with my kids. Right. But I shouldn't be driving with anyone else on the road. Yeah. So I have the things that I do in society to help other people are also in a, a living amends that any other day I could I could have I could have been in prison because I shouldn't have been driving like right. that. Yeah. But your intention, and I don't, I don't yeah. know this part of the story, so apo- I apologize if you're getting was to both, it. Was both that I shouldn't be driving with anyone. I shouldn't be driving with my children. But, but, I, was but your... I also am suicidal, and the only suicidal thoughts I have have to do with a car. Okay. And I'm not telling a damn person about any of it. Oh, of course not. Because you hide. Yeah. That's what you do. So so you weren't leaving with plans to go drive off a cliff because you said you were going to work and you had to get your laptop. Like you had a purpose, but you were also bribing your daughter and promising this ice cream that was never going to happen. And I think that I, in my gut, I wasn't coming back home. So how, what, I'm so sorry that I'm confused. Um, so when you, do you make up your mind as you're driving that you're going to wreck on purpose or does it just because you're under the influence an accident naturally happens? So, so that's a good question. So my interpretation and what I can tell you is the chemicals on my brain XYZ alter my thinking, right? But specifically this muscle relaxer lowered my inhibitions to entertain you know what i i know i was consciously thinking this every minute of the day Mm -hmm. i can't figure this out i can't fix it i can't make everything go back how it was Mm -hmm. and i don't want to have my kids watching me not be able to figure myself out Mm -hmm. i also don't want to give anybody the false pretense you know i'm a christian i believe in god i believe that we leave our problems at the cross and get on with it and i'm not getting on with it Mm -hmm. i'm broken to the point that i want i think deeply i wanted people to know how bad this broke me Mm. and i wanted to relieve my kids of watching their mom not be able to figure herself out so there was i didn't ever want to leave my kids i didn't ever want to hurt anyone and i definitely knew that i had value in god's eyes but i was like i'm out Mm -hmm. so there wasn't a plan of execution always always thoughts 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 always involved a vehicle always involved in if i just drove off this bridge if I just drove off this you know embankment if I just but at the moment the accident happened yeah was that an accident or was that okay was that something that you like here's the spot where I'm going to crash my car to try to kill myself absolutely I cannot remember the event but what I'm saying is those medications lowered my 
um, lowered my inhibition to entertain the suicidal thoughts. I know that I was taking that Soma from my trip. Mm -hmm. I know that people were at the office on a Saturday, which isn't typical. Mm -hmm. They were close to me. And if they had picked up that anything was wrong with me, they wouldn't have let me get in a car. Right. Right. And, and they, they will tell you, they, they give their own account of it. So the accident happens and obviously you're very critically injured. Uh, uh, right. And they so, call they call the coroner and they call the ambulance and they flip a coin because there was no yeah. So were there other people involved? Did you crash no. into a tree off of what what what, yeah, what, what was it? What was the- I crashed into a large tree and chain link fence in a person's yard on a street corner, and so it wasn't a high rate of speed. Mm. How fast was it? I don't know. I actually don't know how oh, how fast was it was. Just but, curious. But we're on a I'm on a road that's only forty miles an hour is the speed limit. Okay. Okay. So I, but it was a large tree, and I'm into it. The top link of a chain link fence breaks off. It comes through the windshield, into the right side of the corner of my mouth, mm. out the floor of my mouth, into the headrest, and then extends into the back window of the car oh my I'm, so you're pinned i'm completely Im- impaled mm. like on a like a like a you know like a yeah no i yeah i've seen spit, mo- i've seen you movies. know like yeah like for real mm. so are oh. you are unconscious i'm hoping you're unconscious during all this a- absolutely okay and Ooh. so it's only the account of first responders at that point that we have and um you know two different people with more than 30 years tenure said that it was the most gruesome thing that they'd seen I can, yeah that sounds awful and so then here we go they call the coroner they call the ambulance there was no way to establish an airway. They were bagging my neck with the Ambu bag, mm-hmm. so the bag that you mm-hmm. yeah. force air. So they're just breathing into my neck for me. At the same time, there's a lot of things happening at the same time. Um, somebody from the ambulance or police, however it worked, recognized that I was a Stormont nurse. Mm. That is the trauma center in Top City. Mm-hmm. And so even though I didn't work there anymore, we know what we know for uh, people that work in, you know, this this tight-knit group of nurses, ambulance, fire, police, yeah. right? And they were protecting one of their own, essentially. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they called ahead and registered me what they called Trauma X. So that's Jane Doe. Mm-hmm. For four hours, I didn't have an identity, even though my purse was right next to me in the car. Mm. My insurance card, my driver's license, all that. So it was a way to de-identify me and protect my people. Hmm. So um, they they get me to the hospital. The surgeon that happened to be on call was, you know, a dear friend. Um, the anesthesiologist was somebody that I had seen within a couple of months before my wreck I'd had met and had lunch with just on a personal basis Mm -hmm. as a friend uh his wife was selling some skincare thing and you know uh, whatever and I we sat down and talked about it and um anyway so so to have their accounts then then we're handed off to uh they established an airway because my friend that was the anesthesia provider, uh, he said that he didn't know anything. Thirty-eight year one year old woman, probably a mom, because mm-hmm. I from the third from this far down, the lower third of my face was gone. Oh my gosh! <clears throat> oh my lord! I so, can't imagine. Um, he says, you know, with tears in his eyes, when he tells me how this works, he said, "I leaned down." with my face close to your ear i'm completely unconscious Mm -hmm. and he says honey take a deep breath because what they're seeing is every time my heart pumps this site of injury is filling up Mm -hmm. with blood Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and it's obstructing. So, so they're not finding an airway where they can go down my throat into my lungs because that's a hole. They're trying to do a tracheotomy, essentially. Mm-hmm. You know, you see that yes. on yes. med shows. Yeah. They're trying to do that, but they can't even visualize that because it keeps getting covered in blood. So I needed to take a breath so that he could see where, oh. where to cannulate. But I'm unconscious, so I can't friggin' help. Right. But he said when he... When he said, honey, take a deep breath, he said that I (laughs) gasped inside my throat like that. Mm. And he said, I don't, I can't explain it. I don't know why. And I said, because I recognized your voice. Mm. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm. things that are. Do you, so you remember that moment? No. No, no, no. He said that. Oh, he said that. Right, right. Oh, I thought you said that you. He said that. But when I tell this, you know, anything like that and people are just looking at me. In my life every day, when something is a miracle, I call it a miracle. Oh, for sure. I praise I, I praise God in the storm, in the sunshine, mm-hmm. and I don't try to explain things I can't explain. Right. right. And so oftentimes when I'm telling this story, especially to somebody that doesn't know any details about it, I'm picking people up and holding on to them and saying, you know, hang on. It's yeah. way more happy than sad. Right, right, right. <laughs> but it, it's it's tough. It's deep. Yeah. And he, you know, he's like, I, I can't explain it. Well, when... The surgeon goes out to the waiting room. So he's going to the intensive care waiting room to call for the family of this 38-year-old woman, Jane Doe, that came in with no face. Uh, He looks and sees my parents and my husband and husband at the time and said, what are you guys doing here? Yeah. who who Because we were close enough that that because I worked with him, you know, oh, okay. so closely, okay. he, he knew my parents and my yeah. husband. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So he said, what are you guys doing here? And they said, it's Rachel. And they said, he just started shaking. And I don't need anybody else's account of it because I know that human very well. He's the patriarch of surgery in Topeka, Kansas. His name is Dr. Nason Louie, and he is precious. And he looks at me with these eyes of I'm a walking miracle Mm. and it is, I accept it for what it is and his validation of that with his science brain, Mm -hmm. there is not a scientific explanation why I am walking, talking. My, my tongue was completely severed except for just a tiny piece of skin on the side. So, he didn't know that was you until that moment, mm. but your family had been notified. They had found your purse and all this and it's, it had been notified. My family by... had been notified, but that was still in a lot of lag too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because they uh, deemed it a, an investigation at first because there was no rhyme or reason what yeah. was going on, right. you know? Right. So th- there was a lot of lag for my family knowing because, and I do know this because I got to listen to the messages on my phone Mm. and the little girl that was waiting for her ice cream. Don't Mm. even. And she kept saying, Mommy, where are you? When are you coming home? And I mean, just repeatedly. She's five, but she knew how to call my phone. And there were a lot of messages. And, you know, some of them weren't as kind and um it's just it's, it's it was uh, it was a devastating day for everyone because it was just a really the ones that weren't kind messages are probably that human that i was friends with since i was 14 years old that just happened that we got married and had kids with he was angry because he didn't know where i was right 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 but the way his emotions came out was, where the heck are you? The, you yeah, know, Emma yeah. needs her medicine. Right. When in his mind, he was probably thinking, this is the day and where is she? Yeah. Okay. 
we, we probably need to get on to some. Yeah, and the rest of it is all happy all the rest of the way out. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, we're, we're in an hour and a half, and, and, and I'm on a little bit of a time frame. And, but we've got time. We've got time. And so I want to allow time for you to kind of spl- explain the next transition, which is um, – I know you mentioned this to me when we were at the fight was that, you know, eventually you and your husband uh, got a divorce Mm -hmm. and then you really started to focus on this hope dealer Mm -hmm. uh, and and love being the antidote. So um, let's, let's go from there. So eventually you're, you're, you're going to be able to recover. You're going to be able to, you know, come out of this, which again, huge miracle. Thank you. Praise Jesus. How many surgeries? Total. Uh, well, I get a, uh, on the punch card. Once I hit the fortieth, I think I get a free one. But I've, <laughs> I've, I've been to the operating room since January thirteenth, two thousand thirteen, for this particular thing thirty eight times. Golly, do you think you're? Are you still going? I mean, is there another one lined up? You think you're done? This is going to be something that I. It it's just going to be something I continue to deal with. Okay. I'm mostly in a stable spot. Mm-hmm. I had to eventually have custom titanium joints for TMJs. Mm. That makes complexities for a lot of reasons. I can only have dental implants. I can't have anything else because, mm. uh, you know, yeah, I'm put, sure. put back together like a puzzle and I don't have mm-hmm. enough bone in my mouth. Mm. Wow. And essentially my teeth are a decoration. They're not really mm. for function. So okay. I'm okay right now, but eventually I may have to have the joints replaced again and definitely have to keep continuing to replace the teeth. Oh my goodness. Okay. Cause mm. they only wow. hold up for so long. <laughs> wow. Um, I, I'm going to ask this question and I hope it comes out right because <laughs> I don't, I can, I'm trying to visualize being in your shoes and it's absolutely impossible. But what I'm trying to visualize is you, you're, you're depressed, you're suicidal. Now you're waking up in the hospital. I can, I feel guilty saying this, but I'm just going to say it. Go and you correct no, me. Like, absolutely. I would think that if I was in that position and I was trying to commit suicide and I failed at committing suicide and I'm in the hospital now and I've got all of this stuff and I've got all of these issues physically, I'm going to, I'm wishing I was dead. I, uh, I, I was, I, okay. So I appreciate you saying that and I want people to be honest because that is what a person listening. Is that how is, you felt? It, that's what a person listening is thinking, right? Right. Mm-hmm. I hadn't even accepted myself that it was intentional at that mm. point. Okay. Okay. So because everybody else, I'm, I'm, I, I, I think as I look back on it, but also I had a massive head injury at first, like mm-hmm. when it, when you look at the residual effects, it is a minor head injury, but all the amount of force that my face and my head took. Right. Like, even just to remember that time, there is not, there's just little windows of things. But I was there because mm-hmm. I have a letter from one of the nurses that took care of me. She's a nurse now, and I see her as a nurse at KU, but she was an aide back then. And she, you know, they said, they did, they did a professional video about my story uh, at KU because I asked for a whiteboard. I still, I had a trach. Mm. Um, and I wrote, uh, the the series of surgeries began right then. Yeah. It, in the first nine months, I'd had thirteen surgeries, and so it was just a revolving door. You know, I was sure. at KU all the time, yeah. and so the stabilization just happened in Topeka, and they immediately got me to KU. So, but I wrote on a whiteboard. Uh, I asked to talk to a nurse there who also has her doctorate, like Tiffany does the pain management nurse. Mm -hmm. Her name is Melanie. And I had taken a class there as a recovery room nurse. And I wanted to see her um, because I was hurting physically then, you know, I do have Mm -hmm. a real Mm -hmm. pain going on, but I, I know without even knowing, I know me, I wanted to be conscious of what was going on. I didn't want to be you know, so zoned out that I I wanted to be a part of this process because now they won't show me a picture of my face. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. I can't see my kids. Mm-hmm. Okay, God, I'm alive. Mm-hmm. And I'm the person that my family is going to be asked, would want to ask, what do we do next? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, because yeah. I, I know there were, there are little glimpses of what I was thinking and I wanted to be part of the solution as far as deciding what was next and all the stuff they said even I said I don't think my trach is the right size I'd written it on my whiteboard and they looked and it wasn't and they had changed it out because it wasn't the right size. Really? oh my goodness wow. so how long was it before you saw your face and saw your kids it was weeks <laughs> it uh, there were seven weeks till I could have a drink of water mm. but it was weeks before I saw my kids because they they did have a clinical child psychologist involved with that because of the change, you know, to help. She's going to look different, but she's still mom. Yeah. That kind of thing. But rewind to, we were in the intensive care. My husband was in the room with me, ex-husband. I don't remember this until after it happened. I remember one thing and I'll tell you but he got up to use the restroom and when he did a head injured patient has a tendency to try to get up and get out of bed especially if they're being restricted from water Mm. Mm. so I was I believe I was ventilated, but I, I may have all the way been extubated and just had a trach. But the outside of my head was covered in metal fixation. Mm. So the bones in my face, jaw, all that were being stabilized externally. Mm. Like so a you, halo? Is that what, is, it wasn't a halo, but you're, you're on the right track. Something a like halo that. is if you're going to stabilize a spine. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So, But these are just free-floating bones out in my face. Oh. Okay. And so these metal pieces are sticking out. So you would typically see them like uh, on a leg. You see external fixation maybe on an ankle or something. Mm -hmm. So that that's all around. He gets up to go to the bathroom. Guess what? I'm still a sneaky drug addict. Oh, stop. And I'm a nurse. And I know my ICU nurse is busy. And I think Mm. I do know that my bed alarm had been shut off because she was extremely busy and... Probably me Mm -hmm. scooting around was making it go off too often. Mm. That never can happen. Uh, I tried to get out of bed Mm -mm. and I was top heavy and I fell on my, I fell on my face. I rebroke bones in my face. Oh, Rachel. And the part I remember is waking up in a pool of blood on a cold hospital floor. Mm. And that is how my ex-husband had to come back into the room and find me. Dang it. So from his perspective, because I, I can, I'm watching your mannerisms going, I'm wondering what this guy's thinking. This guy, me? Uh, no, I'm oh, saying you're, you're wondering what he was thinking. I bet at sure, some point, sure. you know, he's thinking, are you kidding me? Yeah. You know, that first of all, that I couldn't manage my emotions like him and just you know what stuff happens let's suck it up and get on with it Mm -hmm. because truly that's how it was right i'm not faulting him for Mm. i'm jealous i wish i could handle my feelings like that (laughs) so so then we get in this situation now she's taking it further and she's had this thing go on because everyone in their mind wondered if substance was involved if it was suicidal attempt But nobody was saying that to me. Well, sure. You they know, weren't we're asking just, you. We're just like, oh, we had a car wreck. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, it was still a very much mm-hmm. a cloudy thing that people wondered, but who's going to say anything? Right. And so here he comes, this poor guy, really, at some point you have to think. He comes back in the room and I'm on the floor in a pool of blood. So anyway. Then we have a very upset craniofacial plastic surgeon. Mm -hmm. And I know in my heart what I'm thinking is I love and protect my people. I didn't want anybody mad at my nurse. I didn't want anybody mad at anybody. No one gets in healthcare to hurt people. Plus, I did it. 
Plus, I'm the reason that I'm there in the bed anyway. Right. I Do you know this. that? Are you aware of that? Or were you on enough medication? You you said you hadn't admitted, or I you nev- hadn't. I never said it out out of my mouth. Yeah, but in my heart, I you I knew, knew deep it down in your soul. But it still only took until me coming out as Rachel the Hope Dealer, like okay. a year and a half ago, for me to verbalize it. Because how do you look at your kids? How do you look at your family and say, right, this was intentional? Yeah, you know. And so, anyway, that's Oof. that's the weeds of it. But I didn't want... They put me on the penthouse at KU. And so, I've written a book about all this. But How can people find the book? Well, it's not published yet. Be- oh, okay. Because we've got layers of some legal concern when it comes yeah. to... I crossed... Four states, or four hospital systems in three states. And at every turn, there were things. But, you know, I was never litigious about anything. It's my fault I'm there. Right. It's my fault I fall out of the bed. Yeah. But, of course, I know what I know. When right. someone mm-hmm. is hurt, we're, we're their caretaker. They're, we're, you know, overseeing what's going on with them. There could have been things that happened better that's what we do in root cause analysis and quality improvement but it's why i believe that i'm a vessel and i believe that god can use me to help improve a lot of different things but there had to come a time like through after all of this because you've said a handful of times that through all of the trials and tribulations that you always had your faith yeah so is it fair to say, though, you may have had it, but you may have strayed away from it a little bit because at some point you had to have gotten closer to it? Oh, yes. Does yes, that make sense? Absolutely. And so, it, I, you know, and I guess I can say that because it's obviously I've not gone through what you went through, but I know that I've always been a Christian, but there's been parts of my time where I've hit rough times and, and I wasn't able to navigate through those rough times right. as well because right. I wasn't as connected right. in my faith. Right. And so now you're going through something incredibly traumatic. Yeah. And and although you were still a believer, maybe not as connected, and then you get a little bit more connected, which then gives you the vision on how you want to proceed. Very, proceed very for- dis- very disconnected. Always, always I was still a believer. Always. Right. Uh, fast forward to, okay, surgeries in and out, in and mm-hmm. out. Um, they, w- what I was saying about that piece, they put me on the penthouse at KU for right. a week. Mm-hmm. I know what I know. I mean, we're seeing if any med mal attorneys are going to show up. You know, I never should have fallen out of my bed. Mm-hmm. But I am not, would not, never would be that way. I believe that we can use those situations to help so that those things don't happen again. But that takes progressive culture within an organization. Um, I wasn't, you know, able to be part of that at that time because of my injuries, but someday I hope to work on those pieces. So once I didn't, there were no medical malpractice attorneys that came, Mm -hmm. I was put in the burn unit at KU and I received clostridium difficile, uh, C. diff infection mm. three mm. times, mm. and that is also a never event. So as you look in any of the documentation and records of my surgeries and my hospital stays, those events are not billed to Medicare because Medicare does not pay for things that shouldn't happen. Oh, right. okay. And so, again, you know, it's all part of the big, the big picture of all those things. So, mm. um, so the book is written, but there are... There are steps to take uh, legally and and conversations to be had so that no one feels offended by anything I say right. because my what I say is only in the quality improvement sure. uh, space it's to provide good it's because to- of my, because of my history but yeah that anyway so fast forward lots and lots of surgery lots and lots of up and down lots and lots of heartache and heartbreak. Yeah. more treatment in between I've been on you know I got to keep going back on my kryptonite mm. and when you said earlier about how does it change your personality I'm not the one to be able to tell you that but I know you know I was just a different person mm. and so we had ways to mitigate that I would go and stay with 
um, and that acute time, it was my mother-in-law had just uh, retired, and she'd been a nurse for 40 years, and she would make me homemade soup and put it in my feeding tube, Mm. and she took really good care of me, Mm. Mm. and my mom, you know, she loved me so much, but we had this difficulty right and she wanted to run the show and that doesn't work when you're married and you're an adult and so she had to take a break at that time from me so but my mother-in-law took really really good care of me and she's passed on since so um anyway uh we get we it gets to the point where my ex-husband had to file for a divorce because he had to protect my kids. He had to protect our assets. Mm -hmm. None of this was covered by insurance. None of it guys, the TMJs, Medicare considered cosmetic, Mm. not just Mm. the teeth. Wow. So fast forward to the financial strain, stress, whatever. We're getting a divorce. Yeah. Come closer to the microphone. There you go. Oh, thanks. Yeah. We're getting a divorce. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've got about 10 minutes. Um, and so I apologize that I have to uh, try to get you to wrap it up no. in 10 minutes. Um, but I have an appointment about with picking up my daughter. And so um, I guess what I would like to do then is transition into at some point you have a come to Jesus moment, literally and figuratively. And um, the idea then is to take your story, your testimony to the streets, to the world, and try to provide hope to others who are yeah. going through struggles right and quickly i can do it I, every day i do it quickly uh fast forward to then i'm back in this hurt space of wanting to check out and every time every turn that i've done this i don't share it with people i don't threaten that i'm suicidal it's they're serious attempts big attempts mm-hmm. and now i've become the problem of the safety net of my city and that's why i'm so big and proud about Mm -hmm. top city right yeah yeah because because i was a a nurse that had great health insurance i had all the access in the world to everything i'd been to treatment all over kansas i'd been in florida i wanted to go back to those environments because i felt cared for these are things that needed addressed inside me and back and forth all these surgeries my jaw dislocated over a hundred times it's been wired shut more than 20 Mm. you know so i make light of all that but it was hell it was hell and the the marks on my children's uh upbringing that that left in their childhood is anyway so the rest of my life is a, a living amends to that those things and just trying to be everything i can to them to deal with it now rather than on a couch in Mm -hmm. somebody's office later Um, i try to be teachable i try to listen to them but the turning point was again big ways that i tried to do this and i think some subconsciously as a nurse i knew i felt like my head was underwater i felt like this is not me who can't see that this isn't this isn't my life this isn't my story mm-hmm. this isn't me and that picture that i posted today yeah, yeah the mugshot what i was wanting to is, ask you is of that day so it was a public place i was in a public restroom in a coffee shop and um attempting to end my life and the community intervention team is a special branch of the police department and they all knew who this nurse was. There she is again. And when was this? This is 2018. Okay. So, so, so after? The, after. The, this uh, is all. This is. That picture was from 2018. Okay. This is the life-saving get back with my faith, come to Jesus. Okay. 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 So the cop, they, they all, it's a small band of this little uh, community intervention team, they try to delineate between breaking the law and what's mental health. Yep. Okay. And yep. so essentially there's a process around all of mm. that, which the normal person doesn't typically know that a citizen doesn't typically know that there's an avenue for mental health reformation in your town, mm. as opposed to 
being punitive for something. Mm -hmm. So whatever, you know, they called some ladies locked herself in the bathroom and they're like, that's probably Rachel. (laughs) You know, I'm thinking he kicks in the door, picks me up off the ground. I have this black eye. It's, it's, it's just in the layers of things that I, I was doing that you can't make sense of it. Right. I Mm -hmm. had lost my mind. I had lost everything in me. I had my faith. I loved my kids. But he said to me, Rachel, your divorce is final. You're going to make me tell Emma and Molly that you're dead. Mm. And that that did it. So, but he Mm. picked me up by my (laughs) loop on my jeans. Mm -hmm. And he didn't take me back to the community health center where they would give me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and just sit beside me because caveat is that's what people need they don't need somebody to fix them they just need an outside person to sit beside them and tell people either figure it out themselves and and do better or they don't that's it's just it's not Mm. that hard it's just that way so instead of taking me there he took me to jail and i spent eight hours on suicide watch and the rest is history so that put me in another accountability program Yeah, once a week, yeah. once a month. Okay. I had to go and check in at um, the courthouse in Topeka, and okay. here we are. So I got the cookies. These crumble cookies are um, donated. Half of them go to the main kitchen at the mission in Topeka, okay. and half go to me, and I get to decide with my heart. <laughs> and I love on my city because the safety net saved me. Yeah. And I care about people and I go intentionally. I'm My algorithm is tight. Nobody, you know, I give these cookies to people who are helping people that were in my spot. Yeah. So that's it. I love, I it. love it. Wow. Um, such a remarkable story. You are a miracle. You are a living, walking, breathing miracle. Um, and, uh, I really appreciate the fact that you drove as far as you did, much like John did drove all the way over from Topeka to RP enterprises, global Mm, headquarters, global global headquarters. That's right. (laughs) And so, um, is, I guess in closing, then if somebody wanted to get to know more about you, um, and follow you on social media, how would they go about doing, do you have a website also? Absolutely. Uh, Rachel, the hope dealer.com. Okay. You wouldn't think uh, I have people all the time. Wow. You, you're loaded. I'm on disability. <laughs> I live in a section eight townhouse Okay. and I am happy. You know, I don't have much, but my goal is to do what I can with what I have right where I'm at. And so Rachel, the hope dealer.com or uh, yeah, Rachel, the hope dealer.com. And you can purchase, I have merch there. If you purchase a shirt, a beanie, a sweatshirt, I match that with a shirt that is given it to our mobile shower or mission or community health center or a single mom who's just working her butt off and hmm. she needs encouraged. Yeah. And people laugh at my business model because I never make any money. I ain't trying to make money. Mm-hmm. Anyway, the only what? other thing I want to say is yeah. my friend John Cantrell is um he has a fight sometime in july is the next one yeah and so that's it anybody listening watch out for this kid because he has a huge story and he's going somewhere with yeah it. well and if they want to hear the story they just go back to the papa ron podcast a couple episodes that's ago right. and they can hear that entire story and i know the answer to this and as a, as a mom i have to like address this because i know the answer because before we started recording you answered the phone and it was your daughter but you your daughters are in your life They are. Okay. So I took, when he filed for divorce, I took my purse and my Bible and I took my ass to the rescue mission. Okay. Because I knew that I had taxed everyone around me. Yeah. And I was loved and I was stayed there for a few days and then just got on my feet and I'm on my own in my own little place, but most of the asset and everything is stayed together and stayed with uh, my ex-husband and he yeah, um, you know, was there and and we have always had joint custody of our kids. Yeah. Okay. So I'm in their lives daily, but good. But 
Yeah. Just to, just because I, I can't uh, imagine yeah. a mom listening going, well, wait. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you no, know, I'm up in their business yeah. every, every yeah. day. Good, 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 good. good. Well, I hope people will go check you out. And then and, and then Rachel Holthouse is just the easiest way to find you on Facebook or Instagram. It is. Okay. And Facebook, I'm an old lady, so that yeah. I, I, my stuff flows over to Instagram, but mm-hmm. I just don't manipulate it very well. So Facebook is the place to find me if you okay. want to talk to me. If you're having any issues struggling and you just want some resources, uh, message me on Messenger. Okay. And then you talked about the merch. So what is the, that's where the shirts that say love is the antidote, is right? Love is the antidote to pain. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I mean by that, I love that. Uh, <laughs> physical, emotional, both. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's it. So you can, when you go to rachelthehopedealer.com, there's a little merch store. And then there's also a little uh, background of what, a short version of my story. Yeah. And you can get on the list for my book. So once it cool. is published, that list will go out as an email. Cool. So go check out the website, go follow her on either Instagram or Facebook. And so that when the book does come out, <clears throat> excuse me, she will have it. I'm sure because you are all over it and on top of it when it comes <laughs> to Facebook, I'm sure you will be on it in, in announcing when that book will become available and where it will be available. Thank you for coming all the way over from Topeka. Also know this, that we're, we're going to make it worth your time. Much like we did for John and other prior guests, we're going to get you four premium thick cut steaks, four of our famous steak Woo-hoo! burgers, two family size roasts and four pounds of 93% lean ground beef from Brown Piercy Cattle Company, proud sponsor of the Papa Ron podcast thank you thank you so much for being here rachel holthouse not rachel althouse (laughs) (laughs) in episode 35 of the papa ron podcast jillian thank you again for being here rachel thanks for the drive i'm ronnie phillips thank you so much you've been listening to the papa ron podcast if you enjoyed this podcast hit subscribe now on the podcast platform Follow the Papa Ron Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And while you're there, like, comment, and share. Until next time, thanks for listening to the Papa Ron Podcast. Papa Ron Podcast. Papa Ron Podcast.